Now we're going to chat about aperture for a moment, which gives you the amount of light and the depth of the image. So we're back balancing on the triangle again. And if you've got a small aperture, now this gets a little bit weird and it confuses people. The small aperture is the really big hole and the big aperture is the little tiny hole. So I'll cover that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But with a small aperture or a big hole, you get detail only on the subject in the image. So if you remember back in that photo of Ananda, and I'll just quickly flick back to it. Oops, if I can go backwards. You'll notice that his eyes are quite sharp, his glasses are sharp. It's starting to fall off around his nose. And his hair is a little bit fuzzy, and the background is very, very fuzzy. And the fruit's only a little bit fuzzy. So I'll just click forwards again. Too far. And let's actually do this properly. Um, now, you also get that nice bokeh in the background, and you get the least depth. So in that particular image, I only had a bit of a sliver of sharpness in that image, which is really good for shooting people. If you go the other way and you have a small aperture, which is a big number, but the little hole, so F16 or something like that, then you get the most depth in the image and you get detail throughout your entire scene. And I'll show you some examples of that. You very quickly saw an accidental preview of that. So. Aperture is measured in f-stops, and I keep repeating that the numbers are big and the hole is small because it's so easy to forget and get it the wrong way around. F16 is probably the smallest that you will, generally speaking, use. There are reasons for using something smaller. You need to be a bit careful when you're going above f16 with most cameras, just as a general statement, because you'll tend to start seeing some artifacts in your images, and you'll probably start to see the dirt on your sensor as well, including parts of the image. F8 is a great all-rounder. You might have heard of the sunny F8 rule, where you can um, shoot at F8 on a nice sunny day with an appropriate sun shutter speed. I'll leave you to Google that one, and you can learn about the sunny F8 rule. F4 is another good all-rounder, particularly on a smaller sensor camera. So if you're on a full-frame camera, F4 is going to be a fairly shallow depth of field, but on a um, mirrorless camera like mine, um, F4 is actually quite deep. And on crop sensor cameras like 1.3 and 1.6 crop sensors, which most of the DSLRs are, unless you're buying a pretty expensive one, uh, F4 will again be fairly deep. Or, yes. F2.8, nice and shallow. F1.2 is extremely shallow. Um, I was actually really happy with when the Olympus 1.2 series of lenses started to appear because one of the things I missed when I went down to a smaller sensor was that really narrow depth of field because I shoot people quite a lot and we'll go through some examples of that shortly. I'm just quickly checking the chat. Adrian Lonsong has asked, when you talk about aperture in general, do you refer to aperture physical size or the aperture number since they are opposite to each other? Um, generally, I'll refer to the number because I've gotten used to them being that way around and I can deal with that. But I know not everybody can, and that's okay. So if we've got a big aperture, or f2.8, you can see here that there's great detail in the subject. So the subject in this image is the spider web. And I just liked the way it looked. I liked the really rich, warm light. And I wanted to isolate that spider web from its surroundings. So there's almost no depth in the image. You can see in the, the grass or the little bush, whatever it is that the spider web's on, that it blends out of focus in both directions, towards me and away from me, really close to the web. Even some of the web's not in focus if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of it. And you get some really lovely bokeh in the background. Um, you can pronounce it bokeh, bokeh, bokeh. There's no real right or wrong way to do it. It's a made up Japanese word anyway. It's not a real word. Um, and all they're really talking about is the blurring of light that you're seeing in the background there, the little spots. So using this big aperture draws the thing that you're interested in and that you'd like to show down 
and it draws it out of the surrounding chaos. So this is in a field of bushes and grasses and stuff, and you probably wouldn't even notice the spider web if you used a large numbered aperture. Now a small aperture, the big number, F16 in this case, is really good when you want to, want to record a lot of detail in a scene. So this is the group photo from the 36th walk at Connect Live 2019 in San Jose. And I wanted this both to recap the walk, but I also wanted it for my memory to know who came. And I wanted to be able to see everybody's faces clearly, no matter which row they were standing in. And I wanted to see where we were. I wanted to see the San Jose sign in the background. As it happened, our tall friends in the back row blocked the San Jose sign anyway, but that's okay. <laughs> Not everything works out in life. So in this one, you get all the detail on the scene, you get full depth, and it's really good for groups and scene setting. Now, we've talked about depth a little bit, and the phrasing is depth of field, or DOF, or D-O-F, however you want to say it. And it's a choice that you need to make in your images. Now, on phones, they generally tend to have a fairly deep depth of field all the time, unless you put it into portrait mode, because it's just how they, how they work and how their software works. So if we look at the, the two images here, the one on the left is shot at f4, and the one on the right is shot at f11. So the one on the left, really only the first boat is in focus. You can certainly tell that the other ones are boats, but you can see the front of the image only. You can't really see what's going on behind and you don't get drawn into things. So because it's all smoothed out, that chaotic effect that drags your eye all over the image in the right-hand one doesn't happen because you can only see the first boat and the first bit of the concrete dock. Now, Less depth of field is really good for people and products and things. And if we put it into a maps context, the food on your plate in a restaurant is certainly something that you want to use a, a very shallow depth of field for because you don't want to see the things that are around it. The deep depth of field are on the, the image on the right hand side. Great for crowds, great for events and great for landscapes. So if you're showing off a nice park or something like that, then you probably do want to capture, and someone just commented on my beard, you should see, no, go and find Tariq's beard, his is better. Uh, Devinish has just asked, does focus make more sense in F4 instead of the F11 picture here, right? So um, yeah, that's what I'm trying to convey is that I want to show off that first boat and I want to bring it out of the chaos of all of those other boats behind it. So use the shallow depth of field. But if I wanted to show all of the other boats for some reason, then you use the F11. So perhaps if you're taking a photo of a marina for maps, F11 is probably the better choice. If you're taking a picture of that boat because you like the boat, then F4 is probably your better choice. When we come into shooting people, you don't do so much if this is a local guide, but I thought I'd show you this anyway because it conveys it very, very well. So in this case, depth of field is more about creativity and it's more about coming up with an image that you know that person's gonna like. So you use a depth of field that suits the subject. In the left-hand image, that's Brittany and a shallow, soft, gentle depth of field suits what she wanted to achieve from this photo shoot. And it suits her face, it suits her body style. The image on the other side, who's McKinley, he likes to show off his six pack muscles. He likes to show off his arms and he has a very interesting face. So a deep, hard, strong sort of shot's really good for him. And it's the kind of thing that he wanted from that photo shoot. So on the left hand side, F2.8. On the right hand side, F8. Now, composition. This is where we started to talk about some of the things around architecture. Uh, Adrian says, no, not the Brittany that we know from the local guides team. No, you're right, it's not. It's a different Brittany. <laughs> um, when we're talking about keeping things level, now this is an image you saw in last week's workshop. I've used it again because it shows this particular feature really well. Um, and generally when you're taking pictures of buildings and scenes, 
for maps or just for your own memories, you should try and keep things level because it just makes more sense to your eye. And when people see it, they recognize what it is. So if we're looking at a boat, for example, going through a harbor, this is a small cargo ship. The left-hand image, it's level to the ground. The ship has a slight cant to it, but that's okay because the actual ground horizon is level. And on the right-hand image, it's taken not level. And the thing you have to ask is, do boats go uphill? And they don't because neither does water. Well, generally. So the left-hand image makes more sense to someone looking at it. The right-hand image seems to be a quick snapshot. Um, to me, it says that the person's careless and doesn't really care about the image very much. Whereas the left-hand one tells me that the person thought enough to level the image and make it sensible. In this particular image, if I took it again, I'd probably have the boat more to the left of the picture because that gives the boat somewhere to travel across the, across the image. Now, when we're talking about big buildings, if you're not at 90 degrees, then they get bent and they start to look a little bit wonky. So what I mean by being at 90 degrees, if you see just under the word composition on the slide, there's a great big T. If you're standing at the end of that T, you're at 90 degrees to the things that you're taking pictures of. So you're square on is another way of saying it. So you need to be on the T and try and make sure your buildings are straight and that the scene makes sense. So in this particular image, the leading lines along the parked trains take you into the scene of construction around um, the buildings in New York there. That area is finished now, by the way, it's quite pretty. If you don't stand at 90 degrees, you get bendy buildings. So this is the Hotel Lindrum in Melbourne. It's a really attractive building, but I wasn't at 90 degrees when I shot that. So the building ended up slanting and it's got strange perspectives as well. And it doesn't, it just doesn't quite look right. Now, you can certainly fix it up in post-processing. That's the same image on the right-hand side where I've straightened it. But things still look a little bit weird after you straighten images and you can get some really interesting artifacts and you lose quite a bit of sharpness when you heavily manipulate an image and the way I had to on the other side to straighten it up. And that's simply because the, the computer can't make the data up. It has to use what's there. And when you move things, things naturally enough get lost. Ananda comments that some modern buildings are bent by design. Yeah, they certainly are. There are some weird ones these days.